Thanks to Fiverr for sponsoring today's video. Right now, many of us are experiencing the harsh effects of inflation and it's certainly further opening up that discussion for homegrown produce and community food resilience. But there's also the question that can we still grow food affordably? I believe that when faced with a significant challenge, we need to drop our obsession for hacks and quick wins. Impatience is one of humanity's greatest liabilities, especially during the times that matter most. What does matter most is building a strong foundation that centers around our individual context and needs. In order to be adaptable and overcome the challenges that we face, I'm going to share with you a really simple three-part formula to growing food affordably. The first pillar stone of this formula, which basically underpins everything, is curiosity. Put simply, this is just the desire to know more. And there's a quote by James Cameron that I love, and it's curiosity is the most powerful thing that you own. Really, curiosity is not about taking things at face value. It's diving deeper and asking about the why and the how, not just the what. I recently posted an Instagram story in relation to this about my frustrations with the dogma that exists around no dig and permaculture and that I think it's denying us the opportunity to truly achieve what we need to achieve in our gardens. What I really think we need to focus on is the guiding principles of no dig and permaculture so we can cut out the fluff and create the solutions that actually matter and make a long-term difference. So how exactly can you apply curiosity to all of this? The most important thing is to ask questions, to listen without judgment, to read up one specific topic, but from multiple different sources, to then think and ponder about what will work best in your site Choose and cherry pick the things that make sense to you, give them a go, assess, and then adjust as necessary. So one challenge right now a lot of us gardeners are facing is a rising price of compost and also the rising price of food and trying to create enough compost in our gardens without sacrificing space to grow food. Something for me that came out of that challenge and being curious led to creating the kind of the theory of compost pathways. And the one that I've made is already generating and yielding usable multiple compost for my beds. And I've had to sacrifice no growing space for that. And with curiosity, it's really important to question the things that you hear and find out yourself, even the things that I say. You know, I question everything that I'm learning about and think, how can I adapt it or apply it to this garden? And a lot has benefited from that. I question many of the dozens of comments that I get from people saying that I shouldn't touch grass clippings, I shouldn't use it as a mulch in this garden, I should never do it because it can cause weed issues, slug issues, uh, cool the soil temperature. And I think when you hear the words should never, it needs to be challenged. Otherwise, we could actually be missing out from something. And I did indeed challenge those questions. And I'll cover a bit more about how I challenged that in the next part of the formula. Is there any guesses what it is? I actually asked my colleagues to guess the three parts. And this was the one thing that everyone did guess. And it's probably because they know me well. And that is soil health. There's no point trying to grow nutritious food in really poor quality soil. Your soil is easily the most valuable asset of any garden. It's the limiting factor where if you improve soil health, you'll rise so many things up with it. And because soil, you know, it's, it's such a valuable asset, it needs to be conserved and protected and improved. Today is actually World Conservation Day. And the things that we really need to conserve in our gardens is soil moisture, nutrients and the soil health itself. Recently I've been going down the rabbit hole of the No-Till Growers YouTube channel uh, presented by Jesse Frost and he follows a lot of conservation agriculture principles and there's four key principles that we can apply in our own small-scale gardens that's really going to help benefit the soil. The principles are keep the soil covered as much as possible, planted as much as possible, disturbed as least as possible, and as much diversity in plants as possible. So the first principle is to cover the soil as much as possible, usually with a mulch. In the UK climate, very often we feel limited to 
compost because of our worry with slugs. But I've really been trying to push against this. In this garden, which, you know, I'm in Wales, it's a very slug prone climate. I've been mulching a lot of my crops with grass clippings, not only in this garden, but also in our Project Leeks garden as well, a brand new area. And I've, I'm very happy to report that I've had no difference in slug damage compared to just using compost as a mulch, especially when we've had such a dry season where I think slugs will be getting a bit desperate. My feeling this year is that grass clippings have kind of saved the day with the kind of weather that we've had and the lack of water. It's saved me so much time, it's reduced my dependence on compost and it's helping keep this garden and the other garden really vibrant and healthy. Increasingly, I'm seeing other gardeners in the UK climate also benefiting from using mulches other than compost like grass clippings and wool. Because of my curiosity with grass clippings, I recently tasked a Fiverr freelancer to do some research and then write up a response about how grass clippings can help soil health and also help productivity. And some of the findings were really fascinating, especially just how effective grass is at retaining moisture. So I've made this research freely available on our new projectleaks.com blog. Fiverr, which is my go-to site to find professional freelancers to offer digital services, for example, making my own font, which I'm using as the leaks section on the blog, is playing an amazing role in supporting these videos to help me dedicate more time and resources to finding out as much practical and useful information to help you as possible. I really love the diversity of services that Fiverr has to offer. You know, if it's something like web design or recording a song that you wrote or needing a really interesting voiceover to graphic design, it's no wonder that Fiverr is the largest marketplace for digital services worldwide. On the topic of graphic design, I also tasked a Fiverr freelancer to create a really nice poster to outline 10 free ways that you can improve your soil health and it's available for download in the video description. And what works really well is that even if you have a very limited budget to put into a project, there will be a freelancer to suit you. To see the amazing things that you could achieve with Fiverr freelancers, head to fiverr.co forward slash Hugh and use the code Hugh to get 10% off. So back to covering the soil, one of the challenges that we face as gardeners over winter is some bare ground, even if it's been mulched with compost. One of the things that I'm going to do this year is to mulch with a layer of autumn leaves and then some cardboard over the top and weigh that down just to keep it nice and protected and insulated. And the other thing that I'm getting really interested, the more and more that I try it and learn about it, is actually the potential use of used coffee grounds as a mulch to retain water, especially with an experimental bed when I was transplanting leeks. The only mulch that actually held the holes for transplanting leaks was the one with coffee grounds. Watch this space, we'll see what happens. Another example going back to grass clippings is that to keep the soil covered in polytunnels, I'm actually mulching all of the crops with grass clippings. It has saved me so much time watering. It's maintained a more constant soil temperature, which in summer is actually helping to benefit a lot of the, the health and the productivity of the plants, I believe. But when I do water, the watering is far more effective because it prevents that kind of pooling or evaporation from the soil. It actually goes down and stays down. Every single garden out there has its own unique specific list of challenges and also opportunities that it has to offer. And it's your understanding and working out of that space that's going to be such an invaluable skill that you can apply to actually focus on finding the solutions that are cost effective and allow you to grow food affordably. There actually comes a point where your personal experience in gardening is more valuable than expert experience because no one will know your garden as best as you. So after that kind of passionate ramble, I'll swiftly move through the three remaining principles for soil health from conservation agriculture. And the second is keep your soil planted as much as possible. In a recent video, I spoke about the idea of just keep planting. And there's something similar here where it's just plant something. I think having something growing, anything but 
maybe a really big patch of weeds that can be quite tricky to deal with uh, when you're trying to then clear it for crops. But having roots in the ground is one of the best things you can do for soil health. Arguably, it is the best thing to do because what plants are doing is that they're converting uh, sunlight into energy and sugars and into nutrients that then they're pumping out of their roots as plants exudate. And this is feeding and nourishing all of the soil life. And if you don't have living roots in the ground, all of those amazing plant exudates and nutrients aren't being put back into the soil and then the soil health can suffer for that. This is why I'm starting to actually get really interested with the idea of cover crops and using certain cover crops in a no-dig manner where you don't have to fork them in, where, for example, if you use field peas, they'll be naturally killed by the winter, but create a really nice mulch and a really nice soil structure ready for the next season and extending the periods where there are living roots in the ground. So the third principle is, of course, to disturb the soil as little as possible. You want to avoid things like compaction. I know there's some thoughts about standing on beds and stuff. I like to just, I don't know, out of principle, I like to not want to put all of my body weight onto the beds that I so lovingly look after and care for. I like to spread it out usually using a, a plank or something. But from an affordable standpoint of growing food, seeing soil as the most valuable asset of that process, doing whatever we can to disturb the soil as little as possible to promote its health is only going to yield us a really positive return of investment in terms of foods and improving our self-sufficiency. Now there's a lot of debate in the no-dig world about whether you should use broad forks for example. I think that they actually do have a place, especially right at the start. But again, this is down to your curiosity and you having an opinion, which is going to drive, well, the rain's driving down now, but it's going to drive the way that you approach gardening. Okay, location change. The fourth principle is diversity of plants. There's something that I've actually spoken a lot already on the channel and I'll link to a couple of videos that will help unpack that in more detail. But it's just simple things like polyculture, interplanting, all of the different methods that also naturally help prevent certain pest issues from pests taking over a whole entire crop. So just lots of different plants growing in a single bed or over a season, that's going to really help contribute to soil health as well. So as well as those four principles of conservation agriculture, one of the best things that you can do is owning and creating your own supply of compost. Compost is always going to remain one of the most important ways of building a healthy soil. I just think it's not the only way to build a healthy soil, but of course, looking at, and perhaps this is where you can investigate certain materials that are within your local area, that are abundant, that you can make the most of, you can you know, capitalize on the fact that they're present, what are ways that you can use them to help your garden? And when it comes to soil health, of course there's gonna be quick wins to help, but it is that one thing where if we want to build in security and to build in the ability to grow food for very little money, soil is the key, it's the key to that. So the third part of the formula is something you probably won't be expecting, perhaps a bit like the curiosity, but it's actually diet awareness. If you want to grow food in a way that saves money, you've got to adapt and adjust your diet to suit the, the food that is being produced from the soil and also the food that's being produced by the seasons. Of course, there's things like preserving and storing that you can do to kind of blur those edges, but Focusing on diet is actually one of the, it might seem scary at first, but it, I think it is one of the simplest ways or the least costly way to enter a realm where you start seeing significant savings and money from the garden because you're adjusting the way that you grow food, the crops that you grow to suit your needs in terms of what you like to eat and to use your garden as a seasonal source of nutrition. One of the most important skills actually for any gardener is to learn things about flavor theory, how different flavors can be put together so you can make really tasty meals without needing recipes. 
on my own personal journey of trying to grow food as affordable as possible, I think the biggest change that I have felt is adapting my diet just based around what is available in terms of crops in any given month or season. And I think as well, one thing that held me back was, and I've been chatting to various people about this, was that gardening and cooking or gardening and eating are seen as two very separate disciplines. Before my mindset now, cooking starts when I prep the soil in spring or I sow the first seeds. It's that journey. Cooking isn't just getting the ingredients and then adding heat or mixing them together or something. Cooking is at the very start of that ingredient's life, creating a constant flow from the start to then eating. The big skill as well in terms of eating what you can from your garden is adaptability. And it's almost that forage mentality of whatever crops or ingredients you have, you need to find a way of working with those to create something that you can eat. And if you're as adaptable in the kitchen as you are in the garden and you prioritize soil health, honestly, that's gonna be a force to be reckoned with. That is, I think, the foundation to being able to grow food affordably because everything else all of the things that you do relies on that formula. And I wanna really, truly thank Fiverr for sponsoring today's video. Don't forget, if you wanna check out their freelancers and see if they can help you, head to fiverr.co forward slash Hugh and use a coupon code Hugh for 10% off. And if you wanna learn some ways, if you're feeling that you don't have that much compost or you're struggling with the quantities of compost that might be required. This video here is gonna give you seven free ways to grow food when there's limited compost.